Greetings, everyone. My name is Vishal Chehel. I work for the IBM Software Labs. Today, I'll cover a session on AI and its current uses and the newer platforms for you all. Before I get started, let me set the context by actually showcasing a video for you, which covers one of the premier use cases we have around the uses of AI with humans. Let me play a video for you. I'm spending the last eight years developing a machine that will be able to debate humans. And now we are going to have the first full life debate between the system and an expert human debater. If you look at the history of AI, games really helped us make a lot of advances. Unlike games, real world problems, a lot of times they don't have a clear bottom line win. We have to step away from games. We have to step away from black and white challenges. So AI is now going to deal with the subjectivity of human reality. You can draw the rules of chess. You cannot draw the rules of conversation. That's impossible. How nuts is that it could take artificial intelligence to teach us to understand other human perspectives better? The magic of, of debater is that it can argue on any topic thrown at it under the sun. It's a single debate. It's just one debate. In a single debate, many things can happen. Who do you think is going to win tonight? Well, what we really want is to create systems that work with us so that we can make better decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go, Project Debater. Greetings, Harish. I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. <laughs> I'm spent. So what you see now is one of the pinnacle of where AI will go and grow. AI can not only play games anymore, AI can actually debate with humans. So let's start with the presentation for the session to, today. So the, what, what the video that you saw just now was about Project Debater that IBM has launched. It is going to be soon commercially available wherein people can uh, put pros and cons against uh, a debatable point or a topic. And the machine can essentially take those points, learn how to is that AI is going to a situation where it can augment human thinking, it can augment our working, it can augment the job role that we do. So let's say if if we look at the use cases that AI is um, relevant into, there are some dependencies, different areas that drive these use cases, right? So um, let, let's start with this chart. If you look at this chart, what, what comes around is look at the word search. Today in the, in the, wor um, in the world of mobiles, um, laptops, desktop, etc., every time you want to search for some information, you're starting with this search thing, right? The search itself is one of the dependent areas of AI. What do you want to search? Is there a contextualization that we can do to your search? Is there a way I can know what you want to search? Oh, by the way, when you type the, uh, the word phone, should it be Android or iPhone that should come up? All that cont contextualization around search is happening through AI. But there's a dependency of search with something called natural language processing. That, in turn, is dependent on something called machine learning. Machine learning and natural language processing, when put together, need a logic. The logic, when taken to scale, needs planning. When you can achieve logic, machine learning, natural language processing, and planning together, you can achieve robotics. But if you throw in vision, the robotics be become humanoids. They can, they can behave like humans. They can interact like humans, right? There, there is this whole thing about representing this, the whole flow into a knowledge representation. 
so that once once you have all these boxes together as a use case you're actually coming to a situation wherein you will develop expert systems what you saw now as a video the project debater is one manifestation of an expert system so this is where the ai uses is, is going to be more and more in in different fields whether it is healthcare planning uh, uh, city planning uh, smart city kind of a use case anywhere you see there will be expert systems driven by ai which would be augmenting human knowledge this is called inferential reasoning so ai is is already already entering into an inferential reasoning kind of a, a um situation or maturity but i think i think the question that will come to uh, people's mind when they look at um, this word called inferential reasoning is what exactly is this how does this relate to artificial intelligence so let me, let me give you an example to make you understand let's say we tell a question or we ask a question to uh, a chatbot or an ai system and we say in may 1898 portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in india and if you give it some evidence to be able to answer that question in the form of documents or in the form of feedback or or, or scan document pdf no matter what how you give it let let's say the evidence was in may gary arrived in india after he celebrated his anniversary in portugal now if you look at the state of the art today the way answering will happen is um the celebrated will be uh, matched to celebrated may will be matched to may so this is this is called keyword hit reference textual matching right 400th anniversary will be so the anniversary word will be uh, matched to anniversary india will be matched to india and the explorer answer will be gary but that's that's not the true answer right that's not how inferential reasoning should work this is a statistical reasoning how inferential reasoning um, uh, kind of a use case is coming to ai is let's say the question remains the same if i change the supporting evidence to say in um, on 27 uh, 27 may 1498 vasco da gama landed in copper beach right now none of the textual matching can be done here so there is no way to match them statistically but if we look at the way ai can do reasoning today if you look at the right side of this chart there is something called temporal reasoning every time a human brain starts to think of answering a question the first thing we match is what time are we talking about or what period are we talking about so in this case the matching will be done on 1898 to 400th anniversary kind of a temporal reasoning and it will say the 27th may of 1498 is roughly 400th anniversary the arrival will be done uh, matched to landed because paraphrasing they are same thing they mean the same thing india will be matched through a geospatial reasoning to copper beach because when you do a hierarchy of india states and beaches in different states you you can match them um, in a geospatial way and the answer in this case will be vasco da gama this is the way ai system has started to think the debater is one of those and and there there have been multiple systems um, that we at ibm have built that actually do inferential reasoning now the when when you start getting into inferential reasoning the question that comes is what level of artificial intelligence are we at currently the pyramid here is actually showing you different levels of artificial intelligence let's start from the bottom the bottom one is narrow ai or the weak ai wherein the ability of a machine to reproduce uh, a specific human behavior so for example if you show me a mobile phone i can recognize that similarly a machine will be able to recognize a mobile phone through a vision ability or a cognitive ability of vision uh, in a machine that's narrow or weak ai the second level is the strong or general ai the the general ai would be um, having an ability just like uh, human intelligence to produce consciousness kind of thing a fully aware around its surrounding uh, using all the cogn cognitive um, abilities so it may be vision audio uh, contextual learning as well as being aware of the surroundings now that is a generic kind of ai system um, that that today don't exist but that is where we will go to and super intelligence is is an ai system that will be stronger than the most intelligent of all human beings maybe even combined together currently we are at a narrow ai or a weak ai level wherein we have cog we have machines developed with cognitive abilities around speech which is audio vision uh, which is a way to see and process um, the pictures and also natural language processing wherein when you talk 
the, it can be converted into textual information. The textual information can in turn be interpreted into different intelligence systems. But where are we in the AI journey today? If, if these are the uh, levels of AI, the journey is somewhere um, um, in the third stage now. If you look at this, um, this graph, it shows that we started with something called the, the programmed insight kind of a way. In, in technical terms, this was something like you, you build data warehouses and the data warehouses have all the data around the insights you want. For example, when you fly in an aircraft, there are data warehouses maintained by the aircraft companies to really schedule your flights, optimize the routes, etc., and find the best routes um, in, in a profitable way such that the aircraft don't, don't run empty. Then the second layer um, that came was modeled inside wherein you could model your business on top of data and you could say, give me an insight wherein the machine will do all the uh, insights for you. You don't have to program them in such a way. Okay, um, suggest me the best routes to fly an aircraft with 80% with capacity um, where the month is, let's say, around the festivities. That kind of insights could be modeled and the system can start to give you insights. Today, we are at a stage of learned insights, which is driven by neural nets. Neural nets is a technique of deep learning. Today, we are at a stage wherein insights can be shown to a machine in the form of visual or audio. And the neural nets can today learn the insights and actually give you uh, output of those insights. Pretty soon, um, in fact, at IBM, we are already entering an era called quantum era, wherein based on quantum mechanics and quantum physics, the machine learning will be driven by quantum computers. I'll, I'll, I'll cover the quantum a little bit more in um, the platform section, but we are at this stage in the learned insight era and very soon entering into a quantum era. But um, th there, is, there is obviously a hype cycle that applies to anything to do with technology. So similarly for data science, which is the bedrock uh, driving the AI tech today, there is a hype cycle that we are in. If you look at this uh, chart and look at the x-axis here, the hype cycle is described in such a way that there is an innovation trigger that happens. As soon as the innovation trigger happens, you have a peak of inflated expectation, then you are disillusioned, then you get enlightened, and then you get productive. I think if you look at deep learning today, we are into an era wherein we have inflated expectations out of it. We think it can do everything. And sometimes we're getting scared by, by people writing about it, its ability to actually overtake a lot of stuff that humans do today. I think we are going to get into a disillusionment stage pretty soon. It is only when enlightenment comes, we'll be able to make it in a productive system. So, you know, an example of um, uh, enlightened system is uh, the image analytics. The image analytics have been around for a long, long time, wherein through uh, a CCTV image or any image coming through a camera feed, you could process, find objects in it and process business rules to really say, if there is certain suspicious object in an image, what do you do about it? Right? Th those, those things have been around for a long, long time. But the same video feed today when given through deep learning can achieve a humongous amount of other use cases. But that doesn't mean it, you, you start expecting that it will do everything for you. So this is where we are in the hype cycle of data science today. I'll just give you a perspective of when you talk about artificial intelligence, it can be broken down into artificial intelligence is the, is the universe that covers machine learning and deep learning. Artificial intelligence as a, as, as a topic and as, as a technology started much before deep learning and machine learning. If you look at the x-axis scale on the chart, artificial intelligence was starting to get talked by about 1950s. Uh, machine learning came about 1980s and it is only in 2010 and beyond that we started having serious discussion and technology around deep learning. What is deep learning though? The question that comes every time. Well, it is a part of a machine learning. So machine learning, deep learning, more or less machine learning is the universe for deep learning. Um, it is very, very exceptional at learning patterns. So it can find patterns in any kind of a data, audio, video, natural language processing, text, you, you name it, it can really find patterns. But what it does, it can use the learning ag algorithm and, and most of them are driven by the neural nets. So it can actually use the neural nets uh, to der derive meaning out of the data by using a hierarchy or a multiple layered learning system. So the way our brain works is it learns 
uh, concepts in multiple layers. So before it learns whether something is a dog or a cat, it actually learns that those are animals, right? And then obviously, you know, you, you learn the classification of animals and then you identify animals by their features. It is a similar way that deep learning learns anything today, right? And the way that the other uh, important feature of, of deep learning is if you provide it, um, you know, tons of information, um, it begins to understand and it can respond in a useful way on, on, on that information, right? So you don't need to really manipulate your data in such a way that deep learning systems can actually understand that. The system will understand it no matter whether you engineer the data or not. So we today are into what we call as the modern AI systems. Till about 2010s, we were into um, traditional AI. Um, there's a disting distinction between uh, traditional AI and a modern AI system. Just um, if I have to quickly lay it out, traditional AI systems were where you had to feature engineer the data. Your data had to be massaged to really be able to be useful for AI. The data had to be human annotated, wherein you had to annotate something to say, this is good, this is bad, this is white, this is black, etc. And the competition obviously was sequential. That's why it was slow. You couldn't make too much of progress. Today we are in modern AI era, wherein the data, as I made you, uh, you know, talked about it in the previous slide, is hierarchical. The understanding is hierarchical. The insights are hierarchical. Similarly, the AI models that are developed are hierarchical. They have layered understanding. You can actually work with unlabeled data. In fact, you can work with raw data. You can feed it any kind of images and it will still know what to do with that image without you having to feature engineer that data. And it can take multiple decisions simultaneously because we are into an era that computation is not sequential. You, even your mobile phones have multiple cores today. You can have parallel programs being run on a mobile. So imagine, of, imagine a supercomputer running an AI um, um, algorithm. It can actually do so many decisions simultaneously. That's the modern era of AI. So coming back to the, the main theme of this session, what does current use cases look like, right? How, you know, if we were to imagine the use cases that AI is getting used for, what does it look like? So let's get started there. So this is a use case where we call it as a generative AI. So this is one of the premier use cases for artists, fashion designers, even people to generate new faces, right? This is actually a face of a person that doesn't exist. You wouldn't believe it, but maybe you should, but this has been generated by an AI system, right? There's a website which you can search on the net. It's called, this person doesn't exist. And this is where an AI system is running that every time you click, it will generate a new face based on different kind of facial styles, hairstyles, ear, teeth, nose, eyes, all those features in a human face have been learned. And an AI system can mix and match them, but more importantly, still reproduce a face that is not only unique, but realistic. And this kind of a system is called GAN. GAN is nothing but generative adversarial network. This is one of the architectures of an AI that allows us to build this kind of a generative AI system. The second kind of use case, um, and I'm going by different categories, um, and obviously within one category, you will have multiple use cases, but this is to gather your thoughts around what kind of categories exist. AI is getting used as an assistant. This is the picture of a system called Simon. Simon is powered by IBM technology. This is running on the International Space Station. And the astronauts um, on board the International Space Station actually use Simon to interact, to get information, instead of they having to go every time they do an experiment. Uh, if you see a laptop in the background, they, they generally would have to go to laptop. Every time they're doing something, they'll have to take instruction, um, you know, if they have to find a switch, whatever be the, the kind of interactive use case. A digital assistant in the form of Simon, C-I-M-O-N, and you can search for it, read about it. Simon is powered by our Watson set of technologies that allow astronauts to actually talk to Simon, interact with it through speech to text or, or, or any other uh, visual format also and be able to get the information real time rather than having to run around the space station for it. The other form of um, uh, interesting use cases around AI is called reinforced learning. What you're seeing here is a, is a robotic hand 
And the problem in teaching robots to deal with Q, the, the, the picture that shows is they need to deal with it in a in, in what we call it with dexterity, right? They have to be able to know the dimensions of a cube. If you throw the cube at a robo hand, it has to be able to figure out the path where the cube will land and be able to catch it. But more importantly, catch it in such a way that, you know, when, when, when humans catch a cube, it is difficult. It's not a ball. You can cannot catch it so easily. It may slip out. You need to figure out multiple calculations and also have dexterity at, at the same time in your fingers. The system, the way this is learning today, or the way it is driven by AI today is, you can actually teach the system by a, a method called re in, reinforced learning in such a way that if, a, if the hand is not able to catch it properly or be able to handle it properly, it is given a negative feedback. If it is able to catch it properly, be able to handle it properly, it is given a positive feedback. It is able to manipulate the uh, cube on fingers, it is given a positive feedback. If the cube falls, it is given a negative feedback. So based on a feedback mechanism, wherein you reward it for something good, but give a negative feedback for something bad action, it is able to learn. So in this case, you're not only providing it data, but you're actually providing it real life situation on how do you act given a context with your surroundings. So this is an, another one of the uh, popular use cases today, reinforced learning. When you, Whenever you see a robot today, uh, especially humanoids, they are actually not being, not, not only learning through uh, video feeds and other, but they are also learning through reinforced learning. A lot of machine in the future will be running through reinforced learning because we cannot program machines to know everything. We probably cannot program machines for every situation. There has to be a methodology to be able to teach them through our experiences. But more importantly, pass on that teaching from ro one robot to, to the other, one machine to the other, one computer to the other, in a way that is possible. That is possible through AI reinforced learning. The other important one that we always use but never realize is AI on the edge. Edge means mobile, edge means smartwatches, edge means your router, edge mean, edge can mean wearables in future. There obviously are wearable electronics available today. Edge means something which is disconnected from a central server uh, in such a way that they can communicate to a central server, but they, they work as an independent device. So these devices are nothing but edge devices. You call them as mobile, I, you know, I see them as edge devices. Edge devices run AI themselves today. Right, you don't have to connect to a server. Even if you don't have a connection today, the edge devices can still do AI for you. The AI runs within the edge device. The chips in the edge devices today are able to process AI. Some of the phones today have ability to do facial recognition for, for you. That is nothing but based on a deep learning model that is running on your edge device. One of the interesting things that's happening in this kind of a use case is the AI models or deep learning models are getting trained on the edge wherein you without realizing as actually may, may, may even be improving the speech to text in different dialects, lingos, and different pronunciations uh, on the edge without you even realizing that. So that kind of thing is also happening wherein edge is enabling you not only to execute AI in a disconnected way, but more, more importantly, be able to teach AI in a distributed way. Um, the other important use case around AI is when AI can act for AI. So what that means is we would not be able to teach every human on earth to be able to program AI and also maybe use AI. But what is happening nowadays from a technical and platform point of view is AI is getting used to drive AI. What that means is it, it has different nomenclature. We in IBM call it as auto AI. Um, some of the other vendors call it auto uh, machine learning. But what this does, is it does the whole automation of AI development process. So, our, you know, when, when we develop a deep learning model that can identify a hand or a bottle or a phone, for example, it can take, you know, anywhere between a few days to weeks to months. We're talking about systems that can teach themselves, program themselves, and do a full cycle of AI development on its own. So that's the auto part of it. It can automate, if you look at the left side of the chart, there are multiple steps you have to take to train an AI model, right? So you have to do, take a data, cleanse the data, do some feature engineering in some cases of machine learning. For deep learning, you don't need to do that. 
you select the kind of model or algorithm you want to run, optimize it, you know, you do validation, deploy, runtime, monitor, so many steps that a programmer or a data scientist may have to do to really be able to train an AI model. We are in an era, there are platforms available both from IBM as well as other vendors today that allow you to do auto AI. When AI can train, you give it the data, it will do all these steps for you. Not only all these steps, but it will also be able to explain the, the, the approach of how it built uh, an AI model for you. So if you look at the screenshot of our platform, we call it IBM Cloud Pack for Data. That platform, when given the data, can build end-to-end full AI model for you. But more importantly, not only can it do that, it can also show you what steps it took, what algorithm it took, did it combine a few algorithms, what kind of feature transformation did it do on data, etc. So auto AI is another use case wherein in future, you will not have to have a large workforce of people actually having to code AI, but maybe a large workforce needed to be able to use AI tools, technologies, as well as platform. And they don't need to have core skills of AI. The AI systems can train themselves and be able to serve you solutions and models that you can embed into your, your, your problem solution further. Um, most important thing that's happening as a use case in AI is trustable AI. This is, this is where the enterprise systems are really, really um, getting serious about something called four, four uh, trustable factors. They start with fairness, explainability, auditability, and value alignment. Fairness, fairness is all about, is the data that is fed to the model fair? Is there a bias in the data? Is, is, there, is there imbalance in the data? For example, you, is the data imbalanced on gender or salary or, or the type of um, you know, people it is dealing with. For example, in banking, you probably have, have um, come across situation when you apply for opening an account or a loan application for that matter. Sometimes those get rejected. Do you even know why those got rejected? Maybe the data that was used to train a model was running unfair. It was biased because it was taking probably a certain higher salary range for you to be able to get a loan. Right? That's what we're talking about, fairness. Explainability, if you have been given a loan or rejected a loan in a bank, you would want to know why did the system come out with that kind of a decision? Is there a way we can retrace the steps that the system took to be able to take the decision and be able to explain each step and what happened at each step and why the decision came out? Auditability is that when you put it all together, fairness and explainability together, is there a logging mechanism wherein you can say this data was used to train this model, which led to these kind of decisions? And I can trace the whole steps, but also log them so that we can audit them. You know, at any point of time, it should not be a black box. You can go back to the system and say, I want to see the logs of this step and metrics around you know, how much percentage of things were rejected versus allowed. You can do an auditability. And value alignment, more importantly, is in AI, there is nothing called good or bad. There is nothing called black and white. It is based on a situation where you use the AI. So the, uh, the decision, the good or bad decision, should be based on where you're using, what situation you are using it. So you should have a technical capability to be able to align a AI data set and the model that comes out of that to the value alignment of the domain of that use case. So what that means is something that may be good in a bank may not be good in a telecom kind of a scenario. You, you may be, you may not be um, a valuable customer for a bank, a controversial statement to say, but you probably may be very, very valuable for a telecom company. That kind of a, what is good for one domain may not be applicable to the same um, in a different domain. Now, what that means is you should have a technology that AI system can be tuned to the value alignment of the output that you need. Now uh, we have we have a system called Watson Open Scale that allows you to actually not only monitor your data but monitor your models as well, such that it can detect bias in the data. It can explain how AI is running, how each model is arriving at a decision. You can validate the models that are running in the background based on decision. But more importantly, what it leads to. As a use case, it allows you robustness. It can tell you whether somebody tampered with their data or a model. 
big ability. Today, you don't know when you're calling a speech to text on your mobile phone, was it tempered? Is it robust? Can you really audit it? Obviously, as I said, because it can do a bias detection, you can find fairness of, of the model as well as the data and explainability because it is auditable today. If we go further, when you break it down, these buckets of use cases into really, really smaller type of use cases, it is turning into, um, let's go you know, quickly through some of these. Um, it is going into wherein you have a um, vision system which can actually look at objects and, and say this is a container ship or a leopard. On the right, if you look at it, that's uh, one of the Tesla cars which actually has semi-autonomous mode uh, driving um, as shown in the screenshot. And it can figure out where exactly are the different objects on the road and it can figure out the dimension of those objects. There is the um, image on the right bottom that shows AlphaGo wherein um, AI system was playing against a game against one of the humans and could um, defeat the human. On the left is one of the uh, IBM systems. Um, just like Debata, we had developed a system called Jeopardy that could play the Jeopardy game with humans. And we had um, this system defeat the humans in, in that game. Um, AI today has an ability as a use case that you can have drones embedded with an AI model um, in an edge kind of a scenario, which can fly around buildings, look at um, the camera feed, and actually process whether um, there is a damage in the building. On the right side, you're seeing the, uh, the uh, AI system actually identifying uh, cancerous cells in, in an output that is given by one of the healthcare machines. So if you look at the color uh, variations here, a human eye would not be able to distinguish between cancerous and non-cancerous with so much of color distribution here, right? But the AI system can do that accurately and fast. Um, some of the other use cases are around, if you show an AI system, uh, an image, it can describe the different objects and the action that is happening in an image. If you look at the image at the left, a man in black shirt is playing the guitar. Um, there is a construction worker in orange. Two young girls are playing uh, with Lego toys. Um, so it can describe the image. It looks at it, it can describe. One of the other important thing that has happened is if you look at the image in the bit, um, in, in the right middle, uh, wherein you have a girl and you have a painting, and you could actually take these together and you can apply style from one image to the other. So it's called transfer learning. Style transfer is done from a painting style onto the image of a girl. What this leads to, it leads to a humongous amount of ability wherein AI can become artistic, right? The image shown um, um, at the right top is about something called deep dream, wherein an AI model came out with an output of what it is dreaming about. <clears throat> Essentially, it, it, it came out with an output which shows how it looks at different objects or animals. Um, the, the image below is one of those wherein a Picasso painting style was applied to one of the uh, celebrities in India. Um, um, in one of the conferences that IBM was hosting. And this Picasso style was transferred to a live image. And you could see different celebrities as if they were painted by Picasso. And what this leads to is that AI today has an ability as a use case that it can look at live feed and, and start identifying object, but not only identifying, but segmenting them. So the image on the right is about identify different objects that exist within the same image with, with different accuracy levels. So it can identify there's a woman there, there's a um, white dress, there's some green there, but there's tennis racket. Now, why this is important is there are different use cases wherein you have to identify multiple objects within the same frame and their relation to each other. Um, and based on that, you may actually want to have a use case around that. Does that does a person have a gun in his hand, for example, right? So you, you should be able to identify a person and gun and hand, and then obviously contextually put that together and say, the gun is being held by the person. How um, it actually is also leading to some of the use cases is segmentation of an image wherein not only do you want to find that there is an object, but you want to find where is the outline of that object. This kind of a use case is pretty important in autom autonomous driving um, situation wherein not only do you want to see that there's an object on the road, but probably you want to segment where exactly in which portion of that frame is that object, what is the outline of the object, and try and avoid it. Um, 
often you 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 must have used uh, your mobile phones to talk to different digital agents alexa series of this world and and what is happening that that's very very uh, frequently used ai system wherein your voice is converted into a graph so speech recognition is nothing but a visual recognition ai use case wherein your speech is converted into a graph like the one being shown there and this graph is put it through um, put through um, a visual recognition system that converts the speech into text and the text is understood by the system and and similar vice versa it, it can actually take a speech and speak um, you know it can speak back to you so essentially this is the most used um, and known recognized system by us um, just that it is actually not speech it is a visual recognition being done but on on top of your speech this is one of the most most humongous and ubiquitous um, use case of ai ai today is going into a, a situation wherein you can take the face of a person and obviously you would recognize some of the faces here and you could you could you could essentially come out with the same actions of the face on to other faces so you see donald trump on the left side and you see multiple different actors the hollywood actors on the right side the same action that you see happening on the left are applied to each of these faces and in real time they can actually produce uh, similar actions on their face in a realistic fashion now what that leads to is you would certainly be leading into a situation wherein um, a person's actions can be done in 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 a wrong way which is called deep fakes today but it can also be used in a in a very uh, positive way wherein an actor can give a scene and and that scene can be translated onto another actor or um, a, a cartoon character uh, without you having to do too much of coding otherwise in in cartoon series today when you have to code them you actually have to code each frame you have to code programmatically each of the moments of uh, a cartoon character using this technology called uh, transfer learning you can actually have use cases wherein cartoon movies can be built on the fly frame by frame by an ai system by using the the facial movements of a human and a similar facial movement gets done by a cartoon character the whole movie can be made that way similarly if you look at the use case below wherein you have one fashion style one of the models is actually um, um, you know, wearing a dress and based on the dress she is doing a movement but what happens today if you had to put up multiple different dress styles on your website or in a video the transfer uh, the ai can can learn the styles on the left side that you see and transfer those styles to the right side and different dress styles can actually be acting in the same fashion the way the model is acting on the left again um, in a positive way today you don't have to do a shoot every time you have to uh, um, do a new fashion um, or a new dress you have to put it um, on for for uh, display it can all be done by ai on the fly by the way this can be done real time also today based on the scale that ai systems run at there are other use cases wherein uh, ai systems are actually being used by game um, uh, developers you don't have to generate and code programmatically a new level in a game today the game uh, features are are shown to an ai system an ai system can actually develop new game levels for you so you don't actually have to program but on the fly that allow game companies to keep on sending new and new game levels to you right so what that means is it can be simple games like mario or, um, and other atari games kind of a level but more importantly in in um, in a first person uh, shooter or 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 um, you know strategy kind of games newer levels as well as the moves in a game are actually being decided by an ai system um if you look at these use cases and the buckets i talked about um, earlier if you take them into an operational mode what kind of possibilities exist the kind of possibilities exist are such that today an ai system can look at a pdf document or any document for that matter it can semantically find out the information and interpret the information so um, uh, we we have done um, a uh, demonstration as well as prototype of system wherein an ai system can look at legal document 
and be able to interpret a legal document and semantically represent the arguments that are presented in a legal document. It is something similar to what the project debater is doing. So what that means is, and this is pretty hard to do. Um, I'm talking about legal documents specifically because the language there is very, very difficult. And there are contextual uh, interpretation that have to be done between one sentence to the other, one paragraph to the other. But because of the operational mode of these use cases, today AI system has an ability to, to be able to do that. You can actually look at uh, a graph today and be able to interpret as a human. The same ability has been trained even for AI system. They can look at a graph and say whether the trend is positive or negative and semantically represent that. So uh, you can, you can, if you look at these two uh, use cases, I, I showcased uh, what that showcases as a bucket uh, of a use case is AI system can extract knowledge from documents. This is pretty important. You don't have to code and show it. You just have to supply the document. It can extract the information as well as knowledge out of the documents. Today, uh, the AI system, you use uh, different map applications on your phones while driving. Um, it has gone further. It can look at crops. It can say where good, bad, ugly is happening. It can identify the red areas, the green areas, where the water logging is there, etc. It can find the routes. Um, the, the routing that you see today is a manifestation of AI, wherein the routes can be determined based on the traffic condition um, in, within your city. It can dynamically change the routes for you. If you take a different direction, it can figure out um, in near real time what is the best routing mechanism. And it does that based on different classification of the routes, the traffic conditions, etc. It, it can do that in real time by looking at geospatial data. Today, AI has come to a position wherein it can look at a 2D area or a 2D image. Um, 2D uh, is two dimensional and it can convert that into a three dimensional image. So what, what this means is today you can actually make three dimensional movies just by shooting two dimensional uh, pictures. And you can actually stitch them together. Uh, one of the latest phone models which has been launched actually allows you to take a 2D picture and convert that into a 3D representation. This is pretty important in the artistic field that people can actually take um, any of these pictures and convert them into 3D uh, uh, virtual reality or augmented reality kind of situations. Um, AI today has an ability to actually, in real time, look at images, track people, track where the hands are, all this in, in, in real time, wherein they, they not only can track multiple entities that appear in a frame, but they can see where the hands are. And I can allude to multiple use cases of this sort, wherein it can, it can monitor the behavior of multiple people based on their limb movement at the same time. So you, you probably are in a bank branch. Nobody goes to branch these days, but um, given there was no COVID situation, if you are in a bank branch and there were multiple people you could, you could have an AI system look at their movement and figure out if the movements are suspicious just by tracking them, finding exactly where they exist within the branch, what their limb movements are, and are they coordinated or not? Or is there a suspicion pattern in those movements? Today, you also have a situational awareness kind of a thing. Um, if if um, uh, people have seen the movie called uh, Iron Man, you had uh, an, a digital assistant in the form of Jarvis. We have contextual chatbots today, which can be fed information and they can, through what you call as knowledge graphs, combine information across two knowledge graphs together um, and be able to figure out if they are all correlated. Uh, the example here is saying there, there's, uh, there, there's uh, an organization called ACME and that is based in, um, uh, Mike works there and Mike also lives in uh, Liverpool and he follows a football team, but, Nowhere in this representation it is told that ACME itself is in Liverpool. If we supply this information to a bot today, the bot are so contextual they can figure out, you're talking about Mike who works for ACME and Mike lives in Liverpool, so which means ACME is in Liverpool. This may sound very, very simple to you, but contextually awareness around information is where machines and humans are apart. We don't need to be taught all these concepts. We can be having two concepts, a knowledge graph, and as humans, we can combine them and still able to learn new things. This is how machines also are evolving today, and contextual bots 
are the use cases wherein you don't need to give every piece of information. You just give disconnected information. If there is commonality, it will figure out the common information there. As I showed you earlier, today uh, bots can look at uh, information through uh, images and be able to describe them, be write stories around it. You would keep hearing about uh, newer forms of natural language processing models like GPT-3, which can even contextually chat with you, can look at things, answer different situations. There is humongous amount of ability of use cases because of the contextually aware AI systems. Uh, AI systems not only can process the data in frames, that they can process um, information in videos. So one of the videos being shown here um, is, is where we have an AI system not only figuring out that there's a person, it can also figure out that there's a skateboard as well as the person is moving on skateboard. It is keeping the person in frame. So this is important. I won't, I won't go into uh, what kind of use cases because they may be for defense purposes as well as others, but that's how uh, some of the drones work, wherein they can keep you in frame and they can maneuver themselves by keeping your movement and your frame in the center of it. And be also able to figure out where in that frame is the human. This is called segmentation that I talked about earlier, all in real time on live video feeds. AI today can also look at low light situations and be able to figure out where do you exist in that low light situation. This is done using radio tracking as I showcased to you one of the use cases earlier. Radio tracking can be converted into uh, 3D and 3D can be converted into boxes wherein an AI system when it is moving around, it knows where exactly are the cars parked like in the, in the uh, video being shown there. It will know where where you're moving, where the other cars are, are you far or you're nearer to them, even in low light or dark conditions. Um, I will talk now quickly about the platforms. I just have a few more minutes before I um, leave uh, um, this session for some of the questions, but let me quickly cover the platform. The platforms today are such that you can build AI algorithms once and you can deploy them anywhere. So the way you see some of the AI running on your mobile phones is actually built on platforms on some servers, but they can be deployed anywhere. So the platforms have evolved in such a way, especially uh, in, in case of IBM when we acquired Red Hat, we have what we call as the open hybrid multi-cloud platform. You will define one model one time, and then you don't need to worry how you're gonna deploy it or where you're gonna deploy it. Because the way systems have been built, it will figure out based on where you want to run AI, what is the best mechanism to deploy it there. And you don't need to code it every time for every kind of situation. That's the kind of evolution that has happened in, in, in AI. So from a developer point of view, you're just working on the problem, not having to worry about where and how that problem, when it converts into uh, an AI system or AI model, how will that run? Uh, the AI is becoming modular through the platform in such a way you can you can actually define multiple models as modular blocks. And those model, modular blocks can combine with each other to solve different problems. So today you, you have modular blocks around speech, you have modular blo block around vision, you can combine them together to actually build a chatbot that can run on scale and that's how AI enterprise platforms are evolving. So AI is being designed in modular fashion today. The platforms are also running on edge. As I talked earlier, the platforms are also being trained on the edge. So mobile phones are not only using AI, but they are also being used to train AI, either through vision or through speech, or, or there are multiple other use cases that I cannot probably talk about, which are defense related purposes that are actually being used through the mobiles. But um, uh, the important aspect is that you as students and developers will actually have ability to program AI on the edge devices uh, and, and be able to use any of the open source that exists today and, and such that you wouldn't have to worry about when I'm designing it for mobile, would it run only on mobile or can it run on any kind of other platform? And that's where the earlier slide was covering. You can you know design once and deploy it anywhere. Uh, we also have uh, systems which are combining all of this together. We call them as cloud pack for data systems in such a way, the right amount of hardware, the right amount of memory, the uh, storage, the connection between memory and storage, 
all of that is put together along with all the different software packages that you need as a pluggable system, plug and play, on demand AI, which means if you do not want to actually use AI uh, in, in, a, um, in a fashion wherein you have to call some other system to, um, let's say, um, you know, you, you don't want to call an uh, API and send your data to that API, you can actually have a system deployed in your premises, in your campus, anywhere you want. All the hardware, the software, the middleware, everything running together, and you, you have full control over the system instead of you worrying about where your data is going. This is, this is more important for privacy kind of use cases um, um, where, where you do not want your data to go out and be sitting on some cloud platform that you have no control over. Uh, the newer future is actually pretty look, uh, looking pretty exciting. If you look at the platform, there is a custom hardware being built for AI. The chips are built. built. IBM has already designed a chip called TrueNorth. TrueNorth has already been uh, tested on Samsung uh, mobile phones. Plus, it is being embedded into, uh, into a lot of other hardware PCs such that the neural nets that I talked about are actually designed within the chip itself such that it runs your AI model on the edge very, 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 very fast. So it's like your brain is, is designed using neural nets on a chip. You may want to read upon it. It has humongous amount of use cases. That's how your mobiles are becoming much, much more powerful because you have neural chips like True North on your mobile sets. Um, in, in near future, and when I say near future, it is probably next five years, the quantum assisted artificial intelligence is going to really, really pick up. So what, what, what that means is that AI system today uh, run on what we call as classical computers. They don't run on uh, quantum um, in all the places, but IBM has designed a system called quantum um, a system in such a way that you can run your AI algorithm, the machine learning, deep learning onto a quantum assisted system, such a way that the limitation that exists in a, in a, in a classical system today, even the supercomputers, that can be overcome by a quantum system. I won't go, I don't uh, probably, it will need a separate session to be able to make you understand what quantum systems are. But today, uh, today's classical computers have this limitation that they can only process the data in binaries, right? Uh, and they can only uh, process the data in either um, um, yes and a no kind of a feature. While we are talking about systems that don't work in binaries, they work in what we call as qubits. You can have multiple states of data being presented at any point of time. So um, you may want to read upon what is quantum physics and quantum um, theory, uh, but more importantly, it can do something called entanglement of your data such that it can represent the same data in multiple situation at the same time. You don't, you, you don't have just a true or false state. You can have multiple states at the same time and all those states can be acted in parallel in, in such a way when you start doing AI using, using quantum computers, you will have humongous amount of speed that is not even achievable today. So what are we looking at? We are looking at kind of, um, th this is a picture of a quantum system that IBM has. Um, um, it's on the left side. You, you are entering a situation wherein when you have to do a vaccination or a drug discovery, you can do those simulations using quantum computing in, in, in very, very crunched uh, time frame rather than you having to take many, many years to really find a new drug or a new uh, chemical formula even for vaccination for that matter. The simulation can be done very, very quickly using quantum computer. It can do optimization problem like routing and all those that, that take a few minutes today in real time. Um, it, the the robots that are gonna be in future will be dri driven by quantum assisted artificial intelligence such that their thinking, situational thinking for solving different problem will be much, much more than humans. When you marry a, a humanoid system with a quantum computing um, kind of a system, they will have a true AI capability or generic AI capability. This is the kind of platforms that are getting developed. Um, I don't want to go into how quantum augments artificial. This may be a little deep subject, but it, it allows you to develop your feature space to be really, really uh, 
really rich. Uh, let me give you an example how, how uh, this behaves. Uh, if I was to take this picture of a pipe, undersea pipeline, and if I supply this to a classical computer that is running AI, if you look at the picture below the pipe, it is able to distinguish the good areas from the bad areas, but it is still leaving out. So let's say if the good areas were the blue ones and the bad uh, ones are the red ones, um, it is still not able to distinguish those areas in a very clean fashion. What, what, the kind of use case this is, if you want to identify the cracks in a pipeline under sea through a robo. Now, classical computers will be able to catch some cracks, but not all. But when we ran the same picture through a quantum computer, it was, and if you look at the output, graphical output below, it was able to find all kinds of different cracks that uh, uh, appear in the pipeline, even though the picture was the same, but they were supplied to different computers, one to the classical, the other to the quantum. And it could, be, it could not only uh, find all the defects, it could find them at scale. So quantum computers will allow you to uh, distinguish defects and other kind of features much, much more quickly and much more distinctly uh, through the quantum uh, driven machine learning. If I was to give you an ex example of a scale, let's say if a classical algorithm uh, with an exponential scaling was to run on a classical computer, it will take, let's say, if it takes, uh, not, not everything fits on a qu quantum computer, by the way. If it takes about 330 years on a classical computer, it takes about 10 minutes on a quantum. If it takes 3,300 years, it takes about 11 minutes. If it, on a classical algorithm, it takes about the age of universe, quantum will still be able to solve that within 24 minutes. That's the kind of scale we're looking at. That's the kind of ability that the platforms are developing at. I will pr stop here and probably try and take and answer some questions. Let me end the slideshow here and try and address some of the questions. Uh, okay, I think we have quite a lot. How much AI is important? Well, AI is important just that, um, let, let me go uh, one by one and see how many I can answer uh, given the time is a little less now. Um, AI is pretty important, just that we don't realize it. We are already using AI for our conversation with the um, um, machines, for, for routing, for selecting the best um, item, um, the best price online. All of that is being driven by AI, either through a deep learning or a machine learning algorithm. Uh, Risper, will we be taught big data tools? I would leave that to the uh, team at IIT and NPTEL to really figure out whether you will be uh, taught big data tools. Not in this session. This session was limited to the use cases and the platforms. Uh, what is, <coughs> excuse me, what is NPL? Oh, um, um, the, I didn't utter the word NPL. Uh, it was NLP, I think that is what you meant. It is natural language processing, wherein your spoken words can be converted into text and be understood um, just the way, <coughs> sorry, uh, just the way humans understand. Uh, how can deep learning affect our perception on graphical user interface? Pretty important um, uh, question. Um, I, I we, we foresee that, um, moving forward, a lot of your interfaces with machines like mobiles or computers will not be just uh, just two dimensional, they may be three dimensional through uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. That is where AI will come, where in your graphical user interfaces and how they are produced and how they are pro processed will also be done through a deep learning algorithm and somewhere at the back end. Uh, uh, I'm just picking up ones which are uh, a few relevant, which are not more career oriented. This seems like a lot of career oriented questions here. Uh, uh, are they being stepped? Huh. So there, there's a there's a question uh, around: Are the steps being taken to control the abuse of AI? Yes, uh, I, I showed you one of the slides called "What's an Open Scale." There is technology being built on platforms such a way that AI is explainable, auditable, and it is not biased. So those steps are taken in such a way that every time in future you will start using AI through platforms, 
the platform should have capability to be able to uh, you know, tell you why that decision was taken, explain it, and audit it. Um, the name uh, to remember for you would be Watson OpenScale, and you can search for it and learn more about it. What is the difference uh, between, OK, let me just expand. Sorry, not able to. I, I think the question is, what is the difference between AI and robotics? Robotics is, uh, is something which is manifestation of a machine um, in different forms to augment a human's work. Uh, robotics doesn't have to be run by AI. It can be run even by a program. But we are uh, entering a situation wherein uh, robots can be run through an AI system and does, doesn't have to be programmed. I think I think uh, I think there's an interesting question that has come up. Can a quantum computer code itself? Um, at this point of time, the quantum computers have to be coded. They can't code themselves as of now. Uh, I think the time is up. I will stop uh, sharing the screen. Um, and I think it's the time to also probably end the session. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you all.